Chair, my colleague from Texas. Um, a couple of points. Um, Mr. Van Drew, are you, you, you familiar with Kayla Hamilton? I am, Congressman. Yeah. Um, Aiden Clark, Elizabeth Medina, Jeremy Powell Caceres, um, and obviously Lake and Riley. What do they all have in common? They all have in common that they're all victims. They all have in common that they've lost their lives. They all have in common that it didn't need to happen. Uh, this has nothing to do with crime rates. It has to do with the fact if we didn't allow an uncontrolled amount of illegals to come into the United States of America, they would be alive today. And I would add one other thing that, that I think brings these together being in common, or at least most of them. Uh, with respect to Kayla Hamilton, a resident of Aberdeen, Maryland, you know, just up the road from here, um, who was um, a big, who was uh, someone who suffered from autism, uh, 20 years old. She was uh, attacked, raped, and beaten to death in her home in July of 2022 almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, by a 17-year-old illegal alien from El Salvador who showed up in March of 2022 and was released into the country. So there, we've got a release by the administration. We have, and by the way, uh, was a documented MS-13 gang member. Um, Aiden Clark, was a 10-year-old boy in Ohio who was killed when a school bus was struck uh, by someone who was here illegally. Elizabeth Medina in Texas, this one tends to be under the radar screen, uh, uh, despite the fact in December of 2023, this 16-year-old girl was found dead by her mother in the bathtub in Edna, Texas, in her home when her mother was going out to see her perform in a local Christmas parade with her cheer squad, but she never showed up. Uh, the suspect is a 23-year-old illegal alien who overstayed his visa for the past five years. And then um, Jeremy Powell Caceres, two-year-old right here in Montgomery County, Maryland, miles away from where we sit right now, was killed by a 25-year-old illegal alien from El Salvador, twice deported, twice deported, who was um, arrested for theft, was released by the Montgomery County Police Department. Now, this was something we tried to address in a bill last week, theft and ICE detainers. Shockingly, had 37 Democrats who voted for that one, which meant the overwhelming majority of Democrats voted against it, I would note. Um, and that uh, this uh, individual was uh, also someone that had been released. We have a Venezuelan national arrested in Campbell County, Virginia, for sexual offenses against a minor crossed illegally in September of 2023, just six months ago, and was released into the United States. I wonder how the parents of that minor feel about the current border security, quote unquote, policies of the current administration. August of 2023, a police officer in Chesapeake, Virginia, was struck by a Nicaraguan national driving under the influence. In May 2023, Honduran national um, raped a teenage girl in a restaurant bathroom in Prattville, Alabama. Had a prior criminal record in Honduras when he was apprehended crossing illegally in November of 2021, but was released. I could go on. I, th I think the point that I want to make is what gets lost in all of the numbers, because nobody can comprehend, it's like the national debt. 
$34.4 trillion. Nobody knows what that means. I can tell you what it means. It means it's going to be $40 trillion in the blink of an eye because this place has no ability to control itself, but that's for a different rules committee meeting. But relevant here because this body is going to vote to fund all this nonsense next week, including a bunch of Republicans, I might add. Um, but I would, I would point out that the, the releases are the key issue here. People like to try to obfuscate the truth of the numbers. They go back 20 years and they say, well, these numbers are just as bad in 1999 or 2000 or 2001, or they go pick a, a time when there was a decent number of apprehensions. But the truth is, I, I think the gentleman might know this, we served together on the Judiciary Committee. The truth is at that point, there was a significant number of Mexican nationals that we were encountering at the border. Uh, and the, the fact is the landscape has changed dramatically over time, which was something the Trump administration was dealing with, and using the powers in front of them to try to deal with it, whether it was crafting the migrant protection protocols, remain in Mexico policies, which were tossed aside by this administration, or whether it was, in fact, using Title 42, uh, when that was a tool available during a health crisis, to stem the tide because there had been so many abuses of our laws. Now, something that gets lost in the shuffle, I think, again, I assume the gentleman agrees as someone who served on the Judiciary Committee with me, that my colleagues colleagues who say that the president has no power, it's just false. I assume the gentleman agrees with that. The president, the president has the power to, to, to deal with this. Would the gentleman like to ex expand on that? I, absolutely. The president does have the power. That's why this resolution is worthy. It lays it out. It's a roadmap of where we can go and what he can do. And unfortunately, folks on the other side think by saying something over and over and over again that he doesn't have the power, that eventually the American public will believe it. It's why we need to do this resolution to make sure that they understand what the truth is. And I assume the gentleman agrees that what the president could, for example, reassert uh, the proper application of parole authority to be on a case-by-case -case basis rather than the mass parole, which, by the way, it was mass parole policies that has resulted in a good number of the releases that I'm talking about here that has resulted in the death of Americans. It is the parole policies that have been abused that led to the individual that was released through El Paso that went to New York, ended up in Georgia, and ended up killing Lakin. It's, it's, it's pronounced Lakin, not Lincoln. Lakin Riley in Georgia. And... Uh, those release policies, just to be very clear, I mean, these, these things matter. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle will gloss over this. The President of the United States and his Secretary of Homeland Security has the power to apply the law as it is written that parole would only be processed on a case-by-case -case basis and not have mass parole. Does the gentleman agree? Absolutely, and I would say that is one of the reasons we've had these tragedies, and as the gentleman knows from Texas, the other reason is because individuals who have been caught, who have been detained, are then released, commit some more minor crimes first, and in many of these cases, then go on to commit the ultimate crime. And, but I, I think it merits making one other point, which is I do have some colleagues who have said that we don't need additional laws, and that's also untrue, because there are laws or judicial opinions or rulings that have been being abused now for at least a couple of decades that are part of the problem. So when we say catch and release, I have colleagues who have no idea what catch and release means. You use that phrase every single day. Because it has an English definition, like sort of a textual definition, right? Well, you catch and release. Well, hell, we don't have a catch and release anymore. We don't even have to catch. It's encounter, process, and release. That's what we do. So there is no catch and release. It's just encounter and release. And so the, the catch and release, when we talk about fixing catch and release, what we're talking about is the Flores settlement. When we're talking about historically what we were dealing with in the past is fixing catch and release because we had judicial opinion that created a, a, a structure by which we were unable to deal with uh, how we manage dealing with processing individuals, and dealing with the law without being forced to deal with catch and release. So we have fixes to that legislatively. What we call TBPRA, which no one in America knows that means, dealing with unaccompanied alien children. Well, I, I gave an example of a dead American, an American who was dead 
because we processed an unaccompanied alien child into the United States, released them, or released that individual, which we're doing, releasing by the thousands, and that individual then went on to kill an American. We have agreements under law where we are able to take an unaccompanied alien child and go to Mexico or go to Canada and, and, and process that without having to have mass releases under the excuse of our current system. We have solutions in HR2 to both the catch and release problem with Flores, a judicially created problem. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle know all this. And the TVPRA problem. And by the way, it's not just my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in Congress. Jay Johnson knew this. Obama knew this. When we actually had people with whom we had violent disagreement on a whole lot of policy matters, like Obamacare and everything else, we at least had someone who believed that there was law and it should be applied. And that when you had a problem in the law, maybe you should fix it. President Obama's own administration sent up fixes to those problems legislatively. Actually sent legislative solutions to those particular problems. But why am I harping on that? Because those problems pale in comparison to the blatant disregard of the law by this administration, by the president and by Alejandro Mayorkas to mass release people into the country under color of parole and asylum. That's the truth. We have had an extraordinary number of individuals get released into the United States, something in the order of magnitude of four and a half million people released into the United States under this administration's watch. Is that not correct, Mr. Van Drew? It's correct, Congressman. Seven and a half million encounters, but four and a half million releases. But here's the last point I want to make. Is the gentleman from New Jersey not as troubled as I am that of everything we're talking about here in terms of releases, the known gang individuals, the known individuals that we are releasing, for example, from Haiti, even as marauding bands of gangs are turning Haiti into a cannibalistic hellhole, we are processing individuals from Haiti on mass parole with very little understanding of who they are or what they bring in terms of dangers to the United States. But I can promise you that while Lake and Riley's head was getting bashed in by someone that was released into the United States, and that, that is what happened. This young woman's head was bashed in by an individual released by the policies of Joe Biden and his radical progressive Democratic apologists, who all should have to parade through the home of the Rileys and apologize for their ridiculous policies that have resulted in the death of dead Americans, including the Texan whose mom went to go see her daughter at a parade and comes home to find her dead in the bathtub. Again, because directly, directly as a result of the policies of this administration and radical progressive Democrats who do not give a wit about the law. That's the truth. 1.8 million gotaways. I saw a stat yesterday that there was alarm bells going off that there were 1,200 known gotaways in one day. What this administration is doing to the people of this country and endangering them is criminal. We should impeach Joe Biden tomorrow for his reckless disregard of the Constitution and the law and endangering people like Lake and Riley and all of our kids and all of the people in our community. You don't need to go look at Hunter's laptop. You don't need to go down through all the complications. This president, this president has chosen to endanger the people he was sworn to protect. That is the truth. And that is why this resolution matters, because it is important to lay out the case and see who votes for it and who doesn't. Because the American people are watching, and they're watching and they want to know whether people are going to stand up and protect the people that they're sworn to defend. One last point, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, Mr. Andrew. Republicans passed H.R. 2 just a little over a year ago, correct? Correct, Congressman. And H.R. 2 would address virtually all of the issues that I just outlined, right? It was a good bill, Congressman. Yes, it would. It would have addressed the catch and release floors. It would have addressed the unaccompanied alien children issue. It would have tightened the parole definitions. It would have tightened the asylum definitions. It would have made it possible to be able to detain individuals, have remain in Mexico, or have expedited removal, but end the mass releases into the United States that are endangering people. 
Yes? Absolutely, yes. It would have provided the resources then necessary on top of actual legal changes and requirements on the administration to follow the law to actually have the, the, the resources necessary to process all that, correct? Correct. It would have, it would have tightened, buttoned up the border in a relatively short period of time. And importantly, had we just given resources, as my Democratic colleagues suggest we should do, if we just provide resources, what will those resources be used for by this administration? Well, we know what it's going to be used for. It would basically codify illegal immigration, so it would create even quicker processing, uh, legalize what is essentially illegal, and move more illegals into the country uh, probably than we've ever seen before. And, and as I said, uh, Congressman Roy, before you were here, one of the, the only thing worse than doing nothing in life is to do something that isn't good and pretend that it is something. And I believe that the gentleman, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but that Lake and Riley's killer is uh, confirmed to be a gang member from the Venezuelan uh, prison gang, um, uh, one of the most violent uh, uh, gangs in Venezuela. That, that news, it was confirmed today. Congressman, it was. And um, does the gentleman agree that HR2, had it been enacted while not a panacea, would have, would have done wonders to try to force this administration to follow the law and save lives like that of Lake and Riley? Absolutely. And the real issue here is, you know, we can debate and we're sitting here in our comfortable chairs in our wonderful room, but the reality is those families and those individuals that were killed they're obviously those that are killed, their lives will never be the same. Neither will their families because of our inaction. I would just um, remind people that um, we don't have to try to scare people. The American people are appropriately concerned and scared about what's happening to their communities under the uh, failed leadership of the current radical progressive democratic machine in both the administration and the halls of Congress. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, 